hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jessica Lemon. I am the Senior Associate State Director of Outreach and Advocacy for AARP Texas. And welcome to our webinar with SVP on Building Disaster Resilient Communities. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization with a mission to improve the lives of people age 50 plus and their families. We know adults age 65 and older are a growing demographic and present unique needs in order to reduce their risk to climate change and natural hazards. Many communities prioritize disaster response and preparedness to support older adults. However, mitigation planning ensures a more comprehensive approach to protecting older adults, the environment, and the whole community. AARP is committed to advancing age-friendly solutions that create more livable communities for people of all ages and abilities. And disaster resiliency is a huge part of that effort. So now I will turn it over to Helen Wiley with SBP to introduce herself and tell you more about their organization. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jessica, and thank you, ARP, for partnering with us on this event. To briefly introduce myself, I'm Helen Wiley. I'm the Disaster Preparedness Program Director at SVP. My background is in disaster finance and risk communication, and I'll let my colleague Tessa introduce herself. Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for having us here. My name is Tessa Barron. I am SVP's Preparedness Program Associate. My background is in stormwater mitigation, specifically at the state level um, with the South Carolina Office of Resilience, doing a lot of work with various types of stormwater studies and things of that nature. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining in today. We're very happy to be here talking about different things that we can do within our communities to build resilience. Before we get started today, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. So first, this webinar is getting recorded. So if anyone has to jump early, we'll be following up um, after we wrap up today with that recording. And second, if anyone has questions as we walk through this presentation this morning, please feel free, either throw them in the Q&A box or in the chat. And then at the end, when we wrap up, we'll do a Q&A session and we'll make sure we get those answered for you. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. SVP is a nonprofit organization, and we began after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. We specifically began in the rebuilding space, getting folks back to safe, sanitary, and secure housing. But since then, the organization has recognized a need to expand to cover the full disaster spectrum. And so you can see here, we now have, we've built a very comprehensive approach that incorporates these five Prongs. So again, we can uh, cover the entire disaster spectrum. And as you can see, preparedness is one of our um, one of our main programs. Next slide, please. Specifically, through our prepare program, we aim to better equip not only households, but also businesses, local officials, nonprofits, and other leaders in the disaster space with the knowledge and capacity that they'll need to make more informed disaster preparedness decisions so we can ultimately build more disaster resilient communities. Next slide, please. So here we have our agenda of the topics that we're going to cover today. We're going to start by defining disaster resilience. And then our second topic, that's going to be the bulk of our presentation content. What we're going to do here is put resilience in context. And how we're specifically going to do that is we're going to take a look at that definition of disaster resilience, and we're going to break it down into its different components. And then looking at each of those components, we're going to contextualize them by looking at specific case studies, both across the United States and then some specific SB SBP examples as well. Next slide, please. Apologies for that. The unmute button was not appearing. Um, thanks, Tessa. So with that, I'm going to kind of frame us out here on, you know, what is disaster resilience? So I want everyone to reflect for a minute on, you know, what characteristics you would associate with a more disaster resilient community. Resilience is used in a lot of contexts. And so here we're trying to narrow in specifically for disaster events. 
So with that, you know, when I think about disaster resilience, there's all these different types of buckets of activities that can go into building more community disaster resilience. So things around capacity and building more cross communication in our communities, understanding what risks our communities are experiencing, utilizing local knowledge and building that into our future planning. Um, and so we're gonna talk through a number of these in different examples today, but the important thing is just knowing that there's so many different things that you, know, you might associate with disaster resilience, and those are probably part of it, but there's a lot of overlapping components if we're truly going to work towards making our communities more resilient. So at SBP, we define disaster resilience as households and communities that are able to anticipate, prepare, absorb, recover, and thrive when presented with environmental change and natural hazards. And you might, of course, wonder, well, how do we get there? What communities are actually thriving? I think when you think about disaster resilience, the goal is to always work towards, you know, the best version of a community so they'll be better prepared for a future event, but self-defining, you know, what are the things that we need to do to get there? And we're going to break down what some of these different terms mean in a real contextualized manner. One thing, if any of you are local officials, that can be a good way to also think about, you know, what is disaster resilience? is, for example, the University of South Carolina has baseline resilience indicators for communities that spans six different topics. And within those, there's a bunch of different indicators and, and ways to think through, you know, specifically within the infrastructure space or community capacity, different metrics for success of what um, disaster resilience within that particular aspect of community development would look like. So that's one tool I'd encourage you to check out. What's really challenging with disaster resilience is that there isn't one solution we can do to make our communities more resilient. And so one way to think about it is that building more resilient communities really requires having complementary layers of activity. So one common analogy is looking at Swiss cheese. Any given layer of activities can have different holes, but when you have another layer on top that fills in gaps that were in the previous layer. And so you really want to layer all these activities over time as you're working towards building greater individual resilience for households and older adults. Um, community orgs and, and your communities as a whole, but think of it as that layering approach. Another analogy that I think is important is understanding that disaster resilience means that you're never going to be at the exact same starting point when a new disaster occurs. It's a spiral. And so that means that your starting point for building future resilience and how you, you, know, you deal with recovery, et cetera, is always going to be different. And the goal, of course, is to spiral upwards rather than downwards and how we're better preparing our communities for future events. And then last analogy here before we start getting into content is that you know, this is a common type of graphic that's shown when you think about what is a disaster resilient community. And at SBP, we really emphasize everything around how do we shrink the time between disasters and recovery. And ultimately what that means is when you have a higher resilience community, higher capacity, they're able to recover more quickly and be stronger post event. And that's so critically important because we, we know that for the lowest income and most vulnerable households, the speed of recovery is absolutely critical in their overall well-being. The other thing, of course, and, and you'll see this in the case studies we show is, you know, every community is different. And so when you look for different types of solutions that might work in your community, you know, think about what are some aspects that might work, others that don't, but not get discouraged because there's so many great things that are being tried around the country. And there are great ways to transfer lessons learned from different projects. But of course, some solutions are going to work better in rural contexts versus more urbanized contexts. 
We, of course, need to do very tailored solutions for particular immigrant populations or older adults. Um, and so just knowing again that there's no one stop shop of what community resilience can look like. And then finally, you know, we're going to talk through a bunch of different ideas, but critical to anything in improving disaster resilience, disaster preparedness and recovery is really strengthening communication across all different levels. So most of you are working at the community level, either in government agencies or nonprofits or as community leaders. And, you know, thinking through the ways that you can both, both communicate best with households in your areas, as well as with different state entities that are coming into play with disaster resilience. And of course, we have our major federal partners that give so much of the funding that goes into this space. But continuing to work towards ways to improve transparency and communication is really central as we think about grounded resilience building initiatives in one given place. So Helen just spent some time getting us in the space for us to now consider what resilience might look like specifically in your communities. So now that we have a strong foundation of what we mean when we use the term disaster resilient communities, we're gonna spend some time diving into some specific examples. Before we do that, though, we're going to just take a brief moment to recap our definition. So remember that disaster resilience refers to both households and communities that are able to anticipate, prepare, absorb, recover, and thrive when presented with environmental change and natural hazards. These terms that we have bolded here are different components of disaster resilience. And so as we walk through specific examples, we're going to categorize them with these terms, with these different components. But I do want you to remember that resilience has an interconnected nature. So while we're using this, uh, these different categories to help us walk through and understand specifically what this could look like, I want you to think back to that Swiss cheese analogy. So. Um, this idea that building resilience will require multiple layers and each layer will have activities. They're going to fill the gaps left from the previous layers. So again, wanting to explain that and, and remind us of that as we walk through, because we do have it broken down in these different components, but it is very important for us to keep in the back of our minds that they're all going to be working together and they are very interrelated. Next slide, please. So first in line, the first component is anticipating disasters. Next slide, please. So using data assessment, it's very important that that is our starting point when it comes to understanding disasters, specifically the impacts that disasters can have. So you may be asking yourself, okay, what type of data are we looking for? It's very critical that we can pinpoint specific areas with high levels of social vulnerabilities to natural disaster events. Social vulnerability refers to various socioeconomic and demographic factors, all of which impact a community's ability to be resilient. A large body of research does tell us that unfortunately areas with high levels of social vulnerability will be the areas to get hit the hardest from disaster events and will be the areas to recover the slowest. And so we need to use reliable data so we can identify communities with uneven capacities for disaster preparedness, recovery, response, et cetera. And in doing so, we can enable policymakers and practitioners to direct those resources where they're most needed. Simply put, if we use data assessment to identify areas with high vulnerabilities and therefore with a high level of risk to natural disaster events, we can reduce human suffering and economic loss from natural disasters. Next slide, please. So one great example and one way that we can do this is with this index called the Social Vulnerability Index, or SOBI. And this was developed by the University of South Carolina uh, Hazards Vulnerability, Vulnerability and Research Institute. And this is a really great comparative tool that um, looks at vulnerabilities across various um, uh, counties in the United States, and it looks at the vulnerability to different natural hazard events. And it does so by taking a look at 29 different socioeconomic variables. 
And what this index shows us is geographic uh, variations in SOVI that, again, show us these uneven capacities that specific areas have when it comes to preparedness, response, and recovery. At SVP, we actually use the SOVI tool a lot, especially when we're framing conversations that we have with, uh, with different leaders, and uh, we find it to be a very valuable tool. I do uh, encourage you all after our presentation today to browse through this tool and to take a look at these different variables and even to grade your own communities against these different 29 variables that all comprise this first tool that we're showing you. So this is the first tool, and we're going to shift gears now to talking about another really wonderful tool to help us with this data assessment first piece of the Disaster Resilient Communities puzzle. Next slide, please. So this second tool also helps us understand different social vulnerabilities. This is just another tool that can, you could have in your toolkit. And so this was developed, um, it is from the CDC, and this is different because it uses 16 different societal variables, and those 16 variables are bucketed in four different themes. And so those themes are socioeconomic status, different household characteristics, racial and ethnic minority status, and housing type slash transportation, those last two get categorized together. So this tool is very useful for many reasons, but specifically, if it often gets used by public officials um, and by policymakers, specifically for emergency response, because it can help us direct our focuses to the most vulnerable communities. What I find to be particularly interesting about this tool um, is that, again, in that disaster response phase, this can help us identify things like estimated number of disaster supplies that are needed in a specific area or the amount of shelters or emergency response personnel that are needed for a given area. And it can also direct us towards communities that are going to need additional support after they're hit from disaster events. So a really wonderful tool to check out that I also encourage you to look through after we wrap up today. Next slide, please. So if you recall, when we defined disaster resilient communities, we differentiated between households and communities. And so with that being said, I want to take a moment to look at this tool that can be used to understand household level risks. So that way, as we're looking at this broader picture of building community resilience, we know that we're arming households with the tools that they have to start building their individual levels of resilience. And so what this tool is, um, it's, a, it's a tool called Risk Factor, and it's developed by a nonprofit organization called the First Street Foundation. And what households can do is plug in either their address or their zip code, and they can look at their current risk and also their future risks to a variety of different things, including floods, um, fires, extreme heat and extreme wind events. And so it's a really comprehensive, great tool that we often direct folks towards because it's going to give them the information that they need to make well-informed decisions to stay safe, keep themselves, families, property safe, and again, to ultimately build their individual resilience. Next slide, please. Um, with that, you know, so the this first step as Tessa was just going through is we need really good data as we think about, you know, assessing risks in our communities, whether again you're coming from the governmental level or nonprofit level of where can we best put our resources and time. And so local planning is in this anticipatory phase, one of the really important components of thinking through how to make our communities more resilient. And the goal really, again, is how do we save money and resources and speed the recovery of our community members, particularly those that are most vulnerable, like older adults. One stat, for instance, again, is, you know, there's so many different direct and impact um, impacts from disaster events, but we still do have high loss of life in different areas. And so um, one NOAA graphic, for example, shows that in 2022, almost 500, um, 750 people died directly or indirectly from extreme weather events in the U.S., and that's still a major statistic. 
Uh, we know in particular for our elderly adults that issues around heat or extreme cold are particularly challenging. And so while this presentation doesn't go in depth on issues like how to maintain heat and um, cooling during different disaster periods when you lose power, you know, thinking through these things in local planning is really critical when we think about the prevention of loss of life. So, you know, local planning is, is where a lot of this starts. And so I've put some different questions here for you to think about of, you know, local planning, they need, it needs to be centered around where do we best invest our time and resources and what impacts are most important to us? What projects do the best job of lowering the risks that are identified by these different types of assessments and tools we were describing? You know, who's going to do the work? How are folks going to work together across organizations and who, who needs to be trained in order to deliver different programs and services? Again, we're covering a lot here, but one thing I want to really highlight is that, you know, there's so much great planning that goes on now across the country in the disaster resilience space, but plans are just plans if we don't find figure out ways to finance the different projects that are identified. And so what this graphic here shows is this pyramid approach of you know, the assessment is the bottom of the period. So that's what we have to do first is identifying the risks and vulnerabilities within our communities. Then next we build up to hazards and asset prioritization. And then the third level is really this planning and, and breathing out of project portfolios of projects for now and then in the future. And then the fourth building block, but the top of the pyramid, it won't be complete if we don't figure out how to finance projects. And so as you in, in your different roles are thinking through planning, you know, the sustainability of things you might be piloting and, and thinking through how much time or resources to put into particular types of projects if there's less determination of how that project will continue into the future you know is something that needs to be considered as you're thinking through the early stages of where to prioritize time and resources so now we're going to take a look at fema's community lifelines and as we do i just want to remind everyone that we're still in this anticipating disaster space so still in that first component of um, building disaster resilient communities and so when we're looking at these fundamental community services these are the different services that communities absolutely need in order to function these are the backbones of our community and so because of that when we think about storms and we think about the impacts it's critical that we're planning for the impacts that storms could have on these services because this is what a community needs in order to function um, and so and with that, it's important that we engage in very deliberate and very intentional planning efforts to both figure out certain ways that we want to protect these community lifelines and also stabilize these lifelines in the event that they do get impacted by any sort of uh, disaster event. Um, we have the, the different lifelines listed out here, safety, security, food, water, shelter, um, health, and medical, um, and, and it won't go through all of these, but just to highlight a couple things here specifically with health and medical, you know, this covers things like um, all the different different services that are going to be required in, um, in the face of an emergency. So think of things like survivor care and fatality management, um, public health and the medical supply chain. Uh, with communications, this is another one that we like to kind of walk through a little bit at a high level and just explain that this, of course, includes all the different types of communications in, during disaster events. But something that often folks uh, forget about is this idea that it includes um, all electronic and banking needs. So something that you might not be thinking of when you think of a disaster event right off the bat, but then when you take a chance to dive into it and, and piece through all the different components of communications, that is certainly something that's absolutely critical that needs to be protected and thought through in advance should it be impacted by a disaster. Next slide, please. So we have listed there just a high level overview of these lifelines when thinking of resilient communities. Again, it's very important that those are protected and anticipating impacts to them. So then therefore, should they be impacted, you know, we can still we have a plan in place so we can function normally. 
So with the overview of what those lifelines are, I just want to take a few moments to walk through the process. How exactly are we going to identify these different lifelines? How are we going to safeguard them? So first, starting out in our pre-incident. So with this pre-incident phase incorporates, that's our, our pre-planning. And so in that, we need to develop stabilization targets for each of the community lifelines. We also need to determine different incident priorities. And with those priorities, our different lines of effort, when a disaster does hit, they're going to directly align with those priorities. So it's very important that when we're creating both the stabilization targets and those um, uh, priorities, that we involve a, a broad range of stakeholders um, because, again, this is the, the line of effort is going to follow this prioritization of these different lifelines. And so we all need to be on the same page here. So that's pre-incident. We have this plan in place. We're all on the same page. And then an incident happens and it disrupts one or more of our critical lifelines. In our incident response phase, a couple of things are going to happen here. Our emergency responders are first going to assess what the disaster was, what the crisis, the incident is, um, how extensive it is, what lifelines it impacted. And in doing so, they're going to take a look at the stabilization targets to see how far off of that baseline we are. And in addition to looking at those stabilization targets, they're also going to be using, like I mentioned, those incident priorities to then actively engage in lines of effort that align with those priorities. Throughout this whole process, they're going to continually assess these different lifelines, and depending on the conditions of those lifelines, they might need to refine the priorities and, and therefore those lines of effort. And so what we're doing here is introducing this idea of community lifelines to everyone. And this is, again, just a high-level overview, but we do want to begin our, the conversation about these because they're very important and it's absolutely imperative to building a community's resilience that we're thinking through these different functions that enable a, a community to, to thrive. And so we don't want to spend too much time walking into that or talking about this in, in too much depth because, again, it's an introductory um, piece of our conversation. We do have some resources listed out here that I encourage you to take a look at if you're interested. And you can certainly find much more um, information through, through those resources that we have. Next slide, please. And so now we've, we've covered this um, this first component of anticipating disasters. And just as important in planning for disasters and anticipating various impacts, we need to think through um, prior, uh, preparing for disasters. And so we'll start here like we will in a handful of the other components with case studies to really do some um, laying foundations for us on what this actually could look like on the ground. And so what we see here is a really great example of a disaster registry. So unfortunately, generally, we see that there is a lack of understanding on where elderly adults and where folks uh, with disabilities are in a community. So that's the first problem. The second is in disaster response, we do see that it is often limited just towards folks that are in um, any sort of assisted living facility. And so the way that we can address that problem and work towards fixing it is by engaging older adults and folks with disabilities um, and, of course, their caregivers in these larger conversations um, with of disaster preparedness. And so we see here a case study um, in southern Oregon in the late 90s. They experienced a series of really severe flood events. And so following those events, the Rogue County, a Rogue Valley Council of Governments they recognized a need to, again, engage these more vulnerable communities in larger conversations to make sure that they are getting included in um, disaster response and, and their needs are getting provided for adequately. And so what they came up with as a solution to that problem is developing a disaster registry. And so what this looks like is that the folks decide that they want to get on that registry. If there is a disaster that is uh, impacting their region or if they're close enough to a region that's getting impacted, they will receive a call and ask if they need any sort of support or assistance. And if they, even if they don't, and sometimes they don't, even just getting that call and understanding that folks are there to look after them and provide help if they need it 
it really does uh, make all the difference and make these folks feel more safe and secure in these um, very traumatic uh, storm events. So that's one, one case study that we're going to be talking about today, and we'll certainly dive into many more throughout the rest of the presentation. So with that, you know, that was a more concrete example of what preparedness can look like as we're building more resilient communities. But um, I want to share a little bit about what we do at SVP, because what we really focus on is building a culture of preparedness. And so when we work with households in particular, doing trainings, we really breath out that the unfortunate reality, given the number and frequency of extreme weather events we have today, is that there is going to be a next disaster. But there are absolutely things you can be doing now to better protect your family and other community members before it happens. And so we really try to frame all conversations, not only for households, but other stakeholders we work with that way. And what's really important, again, is building a culture of preparedness means preparedness can't just be thought of as a pre-disaster activity. It goes all across the disaster cycle because preparedness, it just looks different at different stages, but there's things absolutely as you're working with community stakeholders and other parts of the recovery process and, and you know, building out um, towards future events that, that you're trying to embed more types of forward-looking activities into what you're doing. And so when you look at the household level, one, I want to say that building a culture of preparedness, we believe it begins at the individual level. And that's why we spend so much time emphasizing individual level preparedness. But we, for instance, in our main curriculum, cover five key action areas for households. And what you will note is it corresponds in many ways with what we think about at the community resilience level. It starts with knowing your risks and vulnerabilities. Um, but one thing we do, for instance, is we build recovery planning into how we talk through preparedness planning as a whole. So the reason we do that is that financial resilience, so our ability to recover from an economic shock, which a disaster is, underpins all aspects of recovery and is absolutely necessary for broader disaster resilience. We cannot have more resilient communities if we're not working to address the financial vulnerabilities of our most impacted households. And so when we do um, disaster um, preparedness education with households, we actually have the first step start out as being working through how you would recover should a disaster occur. So helping households understand the difference between different sources of money, whether emergency cash, you know, why you save, how to work towards saving and, and budgeting out further, knowing what credit and loan options could be available depending on if there's a federal disaster declaration. Also understanding the limitations of federal disaster aid and what it does and doesn't cover the fact that it's often very, very difficult to get it more than one time unless you get um, disaster insurance coverage for that same type of event. And then we place our most of our time and emphasis on understanding disaster insurance, so both homeowners and renters policies, as well as flood insurance, and the really critical importance of insurance, but also ways to make it more affordable. And so we ground conversation there to try to help families work towards budgeting for what option works best for them. And then we go into the other things that are really critical as well in our pre-disaster planning, like making your emergency plan of whether you'd shelter in place or evacuate and putting together um, your contact lists and obviously having your disaster supplies kit. But it really being important that we need folks to move beyond just those two things into recovery planning because we unfortunately just see so much devastation and communities truly struggling to navigate recovery. Um, so these are, for instance, some of the questions that we have folks work through, um, encourage folks to work with financial counselors. That's something that, you know, in your communities, connecting older adults and others with folks that can help guide them through budgeting in different ways, particularly on limited incomes, which we know many retired folks have, um, is really important as they plan 
And then here again is an example of the different types of things we cover in our kind of insurance literacy curriculum to help people understand what they can and can't access, different questions to ask agents, etc. So if anyone's interested in learning more about a lot of the work we do in this space, please feel free to reach out to us. We do a lot of trainings for different stakeholders on this, but a really important piece that we want you to be thinking about of, you know, what does it mean to build more resilient communities? Well, it means having financial resilience be one of these many layers. So the next component that we're going to talk about um, in building disaster resilient communities is absorbing shocks. And we're going to start off again with another concrete example of um, something that that uh, communities can can do to absorb these shocks. And so this first example that we're going to talk through is tornado safe rooms in schools. Um, and so this specific case study that we're looking at, this is in Joplin, Missouri. So in 2011, uh, Joplin, Missouri did suffer a very deadly, very catastrophic tornado. And so as a result, the Joplin School District came together and they recognized that there was there's a need to get folks more safe and, and secure and um, and protect them against extreme disaster events. And so what that ended up looking like is the development of 14 safe rooms throughout different schools in the district um, that are open to, of course, both folks in the school. But they are also open to the community at large um, when a disaster does hit. And so this is something that started in the Joplin or Joplin School District and that other district nearby districts have um, recognized this has been really successful and have began to look into implementing these as well. And something that I think um, is really cool about these and is really interesting is that they're multifunctional. And so specifically with these 14 safe rooms, this example, um, when they're not in use in blue skies days, there are things like gymnasiums and lockers and one is in an office. Um, and one is even a television production studio. And so that really speaks to the fact that these, you know, you can get creative with these and they can be tailored to whatever the, the schools or, or, you know, whatever public infrastructure that they're getting embedded in, whatever those needs are, these can get tailored to meet those needs and also serve as um, a shelter mm -hmm. when needed. And so that's the first case study that we'll walk through in terms of absorbing disaster shocks. And the second one is this larger idea of, of resilience hubs. And so resilience hubs, um, they are you know, really great facilities that can support residents, increase community capacity, and provide, uh, promote community cohesion. And frequently we see with um, with resilience hubs is that they function in a couple different ways. And the first one is they serve as centers for resource distribution. So various things like disaster supplies, food, water, you know, whatever that might look like. And they're a hub where folks can go and get what they need um, in a disaster event. So that's one of the ways that we typically see these resilience hub functions. Another way um, that we see these resilience hubs take shape is, um, uh, coordination hubs. And so what I mean by that is hubs where uh, community-based staging areas, where emergency personnel and other critical folks can, can all come together and provide these services and the support to the community post-disaster. And so it's another great way that these hubs are getting utilized throughout communities to provide immediate response in disaster events. Other than that, we see a wide variety of use with these. They're, they're very versatile and, and they're very flexible in their application um, and in their use. We also do see these frequently as physical locations that are safe and secure and where folks, if they're in need of um, somewhere to go, if their you know, house had gotten impacted, if it's no longer safe and they need somewhere to access Wi-Fi and power and you know, receive these sort of disaster supplies and support services, these hubs do function as that physical uh, sanctuary as well. And so again, we see these take shape, take shape in many different ways. And they're a really cool thing that are popping up um, throughout different communities that are uh, helping communities become more resilient. So one specific example here that I just want to highlight is in Orlando, Florida, they received a grant from the Department of the uh, of 
economic opportunity through HUD's CDBG mitigation grant. And so what they're doing with this large chunk of money that they received is they're transforming six existing community centers into these resilience hubs. And so specifically what they're doing, this um, grant is enabling enhancements for things like electrical upgrades, they're adding more HVAC systems, um, more generators and, and things of that nature. And so it's really going to allow the community to find or have a safe and secure place in disaster events. The hub is also going to serve as a distribution center for those um, various um, disaster supplies that we were just talking through. And so um, these are going to be used by the community year round. So similar to those tornado safe rooms, multifunctional, multi uses, they're going to be used in blue skies for other community events, whatever that might look like specific to a community, whatever those needs are. But in disaster events, these are going to be places where folks can get the resources, the support, the assistance, and the safety that they need. So really wonderful opportunities that we are seeing pop up um, that different communities are engaging in to bring in more resilience. And so to reiterate, a very integral component of building disaster resilience um, is the ability of communities to absorb different disaster shocks. Um, and so folks can do that by having both strong social networks, but it is also crucial that they have, uh, that investments are made to public infrastructure so we can withstand different, uh, different types of storms and absorb those shocks and impacts and ultimately keep folks safe. And so what these investments should look like, well, they're a combination of different things. And so the first is, different investments in various, you know, upgrading and reinforcing and strengthening of the different pieces of infrastructure that are already in place. So making sure that, again, those can withstand, for example, a high wind event. So that's the first thing. The second is investing in adequate maintenance of those systems so they, they can continue to have a long life and can serve, can serve folks as they are were meant to. And the last is investing in different mitigation actions to reduce the risks that extreme uh, weather events pose on these different types of public infrastructure. Um, so we have a couple examples here. So things like restoring and protecting wetlands and strengthening, strengthening and securing uh, power infrastructure and that sort of thing. And all of these different actions are going to be absolutely critical um, and ensuring that the public infrastructure can sufficiently absorb disaster shocks again and can keep communities safe during disaster events. So no, another important thing for folks to consider when thinking of this larger idea of how can we build a disaster resilient community. One thing that we wanted to add, um, make sure that we're covering here is that we at SBP, like we mentioned, we have this five-pronged approach that encompasses the entire disaster cycle. And a lot of our work, bulk of our work is in building. And so we do a lot of rebuilding for folks that have been impacted by disasters. And we really do our best to reach folks that are low and moderate income and that for a variety of reasons um, are very vulnerable and have a very high risk to storm events. And so when we do build back, we wanna make sure that we're doing so in a way that's going to leave these families resilient and it's gonna leave them better off than they were. And so we don't wanna build back the same exact house that was impacted and that wasn't able to serve them during a storm, we want to put in these different measures, like, for example, vinyl floor planking um, and fortified roofs. And we have some pictures on the slide here. Things like this that are going to help a family stay safe during the next storm events that they encounter, should they encounter more, um, and, and that are going to, again, make these families more resilient. And so what we have with vinyl plank flooring, this is just something that we we typically put in um, because it's water resistant and um, it's easier to maintain. And in a lot of cases, you know, if it does happen to get flooding, it does dry out again. So it does not have to be ripped up and entirely replaced. And so another important thing here when we uh, work with vinyl plank flooring is the pricing of it. It's not, it's um, two $2 per square foot. And we, we often compare that to laminate because it's another popular flooring type, which is just one $1 per square foot. So very um, comparable in pricing. And so something that we certainly prioritize when we're rebuilding houses. And another um, is this fortified uh, roof example that we have picture on the slide. And so that really does do wonderful jobs protecting homes from high wind events. <laughs> 
So a community's ability to recover is a very important piece of this building disaster um, resilient communities equation. And so now we'll consider different actions and different examples that are going to enable communities to strengthen their recovery efforts and continue to build towards community resilience. So again, I want to start off with a case study here, and we're going to take a look at Harvey Home Connect. So Hurricane Harvey made landfall in Texas and Louisiana in August of 2017. And unfortunately, it was very catastrophic, caused flooding and just overall very extreme levels of damage to folks uh, in the impacted areas. And so in the aftermath of the storm, Hurricane Harvey Relief Fund partnered with SBP um, and we worked together to launch a system to get folks back home. And so what that looks like is Harvey Home Connect is a home repair system. It's an online system that uses data to match eligible homeowners with nonprofits that are reliable and that are trusted, um, that engage in rebuilding activities. And so we we make that we help make that connection for folks, um, again, to help folks get back home. Um, and so, you know, as we're looking through these different case studies and these different examples, I do encourage you to think through, you know, what, where can my organization plug into any of these and what can I bring back home with me and consider and, and continue to look through to see you know, what can be Im implemented in my, my community. Next slide, please. Yeah, and going off of that, I think one thing that's important is you know that's one example of a system that was put in place, but there's obviously so many different things given the technology of today of systems we can put in place, particularly during pre-disaster, but to aid in this recovery period. And so Harvey Home Connect, for instance, was created after Harvey, but um, there's so many great systems like that for other purposes that folks in your areas could consider putting into place. Again, it, with this layering approach of what are the greatest needs and asset prioritizations based on what you're seeing in your area. So, um, a, you know, one more example here as we start to wrap up is, this financing piece of like, how do we get money more quickly to folks? Um, I just wanna share something we do at SBP. We, there's this massive challenge that much of the money that actually comes post event when there's a federal disaster declaration for rebuilding homes comes from HUD at the federal level. And that money takes a very, very long time to reach the communities. You're talking about years, but we know that our lowest income households, many of whom are elder adults, really suffer in that period with how to cope when they're displaced from their homes. And so we started a social impact investment fund. Um, currently it works in um, Louisiana, but continue to work with other states um, to get this similar mechanism going. But it's an example that, you know, regardless of if an org like SBP is involved, of thinking through different ways of how can funding mechanisms work much more quickly to get needed resources to folks more quickly post-event. So what RAF in particular provides is a structure that there's um, short-term loans that are made to fund immediate construction repairs to qualified survivors. The loans will then be repaid by state agencies. So this has all been pre-approved in Louisiana, for instance. Um, and um, once the federal dollars come in, you know, it gets reimbursed back to the loaning entity. So we work with financial institutions that ultimately make the loan. SBP ourselves is not in that position, but we raise the capital up front through our social investment fund in order to enable this mechanism. Um, but again, thinking through different ways in your community, whether it's emergency cash grants, ways to get them out more quickly, there's different benefits of this approach that we're, we're piloting around the country, at least at SBP of our, our RAF um, ex, um, fund on, you know, how to get folks home more quickly. And so I want to show that as an example of, again, you know, recovery involves so many different things, but we have to think about it differently as we're trying to build more resilient communities, because getting folks back home more quickly is absolutely a critical piece to creating larger disaster resilience. Um, this is just one story here of, again, Louisiana is currently the place where you have RAF working in effect. So Miss Elsie Lewis, for example, is a resident we worked with that was completely displaced from her home. And, you know, she was able to use some FEMA funds to replace her roof and remove drywall damage, but um, then her funding ran out because, you know, she was working off of aid and, and there wasn't enough. 
And so once she eventually found her way to SVP, that enabled her to um, get her home rebuilt through this funding that came in through RAF. And she got home two to three years faster than she would have if she had to wait until the federal funds directly arrived to the state level. So again, we're trying to reinvent this that people don't have to suffer for years. And so then finally here, and again, encourage you, please put questions in the chat if you have them as we wrap up, that, you know, the fifth pillar, as we think about our definition of disaster resilience is thriving. And that's hard. We, we just are seeing constant events across the country that are devastating communities. And so finding true examples of quote, a thriving community is challenging, but we have to define for ourselves of, you know, what would that be? desired state of our community being more resilient and, and thriving versus being so devastatingly impacted by a disaster event. And so one way that we're working at SVP to build kind of across all these things that we were talking about today and, and building more resilient communities is that we, for instance, launched a fellows program where we look, work with low capacity communities, particularly in rural areas across the country, um, to embed a fellow um, who's um, typically paid for with through philanthropic dollars to work with local government that really wants to do things differently, just doesn't have the capacity to apply for different federal monies and put these different critical planning processes in play. And so they're acting as a key stakeholder to help, you know, under resourced local governments put in those federal applications and more productively work across um, there are different departments and additionally with local stakeholders. And so um, we're in the first full year of piloting. We have three different fellows currently in, in different areas of the country um, who've raised millions of dollars in grant funding. But it's something that, again, I think can be replicated in other areas of, you know, folks thinking through again of, you know, what are the ways that we can think through for this great plan we put in place, how to move forward with that and, and figuring out ways to create added capacity, having the folks who can help apply for monies to get money to your community for all these different types of projects is really important. So with that, we've covered a lot today, and I know it's just a lot to think about, but we really hope that it encourages you to think differently about, you know, ideas and solutions you could implement as you seek to layer and build towards greater community resilience, particularly for older adults in your areas. I'm just sharing here um, at SBP, we have lots of different online resources, so you can check those out both on our website as well as on our mobile application. Um, these include both our preparedness and our recovery resources. I'll turn it over to Jessica. So uh, developed by AARP in cooperation with FEMA, the AARP Disaster Resilience Toolkit identifies a range of issues local leaders should consider as they work to enhance disaster resilience and reduce disaster related risks for their communities, especially older adults. This publication highlights ways to achieve that goal from the neighborhood to the national level, and it provides strategies and resources that can be useful for local and state leaders who wanna implement more age-friendly approaches to disaster mitigation, preparation and response um, and recovery by promoting community-wide resilience. And you can download this um, for free at aarp.org slash disaster resilience. All right, so we're now going to shift to our Q&A portion of the presentation. I see a couple questions in the chat, so we'll go ahead and start with those, but please feel free to continue throwing those questions in there. We'll make sure we get those answered. So our first question is, what does SBP stand for? And I like this question. I, I could have just typed in a response, but we did have a name change um, that offers it a greater look into our organization. So I'm happy that we get the chance to talk about that a little bit in depth. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. So SBP stands for St. Bernard Project. SBP, as Tessa noted, was begun after Hurricane Katrina about two decades ago. And St. Bernard Parish outside of New Orleans is the area where our founders originally went to work in this really devastated left behind community where basically no rebuilding had begun. And so, um, you know, it's, it's our origin story of where we began our rebuilding work and ultimately this mission of trying to transform shrinking the time disasters recovery so that fewer folks would reach their breaking points. 
but we shortened it to SBP today because we work nationally. Um, but again, there's there's a story behind the num um, letters. Thanks, Helen. Our second question is, how do you help people who are non-English speakers maybe undocumented and not trust institutions and are likely renters whose apartment buildings are often torn down to build luxury apartments is help only for citizens. That's a real challenge, particularly in, in cities where housing stock is limited. Um, and as you might have experienced, you know, so many of our resources that are available out there are more tailored for home owners. And so, you know, disproportionately, though, rent renters are actually more impacted, which is a huge issue. And so um, I'm not as familiar with Austin's regulations in particular, but, you know, a, a lot of different cities are working towards how to have city programs that enable assistance in ways that folks don't have to just, you know, um, share their documentation status and increase access to so being very careful in the ways they create questions and also, you know, making applications available at least in both English and Spanish so that um, more folks can access those materials. But of course, you know, there's so many other immigrant population bases knowing in a given area, and this goes back to, you know, social vulnerability index and other assessment metrics, knowing what that makeup of different vulnerabilities, whether it's more folks that are aged, more folks that are immigrants from a particular country and have particular language barriers, you know, knowing what that makeup is, so then programs can be tailored and set up in ways that will enable greater access for those is, of course, what's so important. Um, in the renter space, the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, planning is done, um, we think particularly about, you know, development is done at, um, you know, typically through your local planning department and, and zoning regs, et cetera. And so there needs to be more thought across city agencies of what are we doing to be proactive in creating more affordable housing in X locations, because we do have this massive challenge that um, often after a disaster event, landlords will, you know, do a big renovation of X apartment complex that was destroyed, then they're able to really raise their um, rates of, of for rent and that displaces the folks that have been living there before. And so, you know, there's only so much that you can do depending on your city regulations to prevent them from, you know, also improving the conditions of their building. But the the massive challenge is that there just aren't the protections for renters of, you know, where are they going to go? Um, and so working to have more affordable housing in really vulnerable areas is, of course, a massive pre-planning exercise but speaks across not only disasters, but larger issues of access to affordable housing. And so need to think about that in tandem with, you know, what makes a resilient community, not just disaster resilient, but resilient as a whole. I hope that's helpful. Any other Thanks, questions? Helen. Yep, yep. One more uh, two-part question. Um, what are the qualifications to receive RAF emergency funds? Um, and also, is there a specific time limit to the amount one can or a specific limit to the amount one can receive? Yeah, so RAF currently, um, this recovery acceleration fund that we've been piloting um, only has approval in Louisiana. So a state like Texas, um, folks don't yet have access to our particular fund. Um, but um, yes, you know, based on the amount of funds that are in it, et cetera, there, there is, you know, um, set up of kind of, what time span you can apply, et cetera. Um, we can share re out resource on um, learning more about RAF, so I don't want to spend too much time, but it's it's certainly something, at least through SBP, that we're working to get approved in more states. Um, and again, it, it, it's a legislation-based thing in order for you know, states to essentially pre-commit that they will, you know, back specific households that are ultimately going to get money from HUD eventually, but through a different social impact fund, and then the reimbursement will come later through HUD once that money is available. And so, again, it's an approach that we've been testing. There's a lot of lessons learned if you're interested in learning more from us about it. But the bigger thing is, we just want more states and places to think through solutions like this because we, we need the ways to get the money to folks more quickly. 
Great. Thanks, Helen. And uh, one more question that I'm seeing. How do individuals get involved with projects that will increase disaster resilience in Austin or just in general, and specifically um, with a focus on preparing family caregivers and seniors and persons with, uh, with disability? So we are not experts in Austin specifically, so Jessica might be able to share some ideas there. So I'll let her go first. Well, I would just mention, um, I would say reach out, and I believe she was on the call earlier. Um, so, uh, and I'll share this as a follow up, but um, we have an age friendly coordinator for the city of Austin, and she is working on a number of work groups. Um, that address the age friendly action plan. And I actually you know, mentioned yesterday that we're hoping to have a um, disaster preparedness after so the, the winter storms. We added that to the age friendly action plan. And I think, Lynn, you would be a great person to per, um, perhaps um, serve as a member of the disaster uh, resilience and disaster preparedness work group for the age friendly plan because I think you would have so much to contribute and um, so folks can feel free to reach out to me directly and I can con connect you um, with Nicole um, to serve in, in that role. Thanks so much Jessica. Okay, and so that is all that I'm seeing on the question front. So with that, um, please feel free to check out SVP's website. We have a lot of great resources, um, checklists, videos, e-learnings, and uh, many, many different things that I encourage you to check out after we wrap up today. Um, and I'll pass it over to you, Jessica, to share some more resources and to wrap us up today. Hi. Okay, there we go. <laughs> There's something covering my unmute button. Um, so I just wanted to mention very quickly, um, AARP Livable Communities is um, our, our department within our national office that looks at policy for making communities more livable and building resources. So like the disaster resilience um, toolkit that we shared earlier, they have toolkits on doing walk audits on building community gardens, on missing middle housing, just a variety of topics that, that folks, individuals, not you don't have to be a, an elected official or a community leader, but an individual who wants to make a difference. You can download these toolkits and start kind of working through them in your community. All of those are at aerp.org slash livable. They also have a great newsletter that you can sign up for there. Um, so you see that contact information right there. And then of course, AARP Texas, um, we host a number of both virtual and in-person events throughout the state from webinars on grief to caregiving to, you know, we have community walking clubs and walk race trainings and just fun events in the community. Um, that you can find all at aarp.org slash Texas. Um, and then of course, feel free to email our state office or follow our Twitter or Facebook or all the, all the things. So I hope to hear from you. And with that, um, it is 11.03 and we're a few minutes past the hour. So I thank you so much to um, SBP, to Tessa and Helen for being on here today and sharing this great information. And thank you to all of you who joined this webinar. It is recorded. I will send it out to everyone who registered and it will be up on our YouTube page um, as well um, at some point in the future. And so I hope you share this and I, I, I hope you got something beneficial out of it. I know I took notes of things that I want to go back and, and talk to uh, some of our partners with. Um, but again, I thank you all for your time today. And with that, I think we are finished. I hope everyone has a great day.